We're here today with Bruce Hoffman, a contributing editor of the National Interest and professor at Georgetown University. He has our cover story for the uh, January-February issue on women in security, reviewing Peggy Noonan's book and Gina Bennett's book. And we're going to talk today about Al-Qaeda and also Pakistan and Afghanistan. Thanks for being with us. You're very welcome. There has been some talk now in the intelligence community that Al-Qaeda is basically decimated, that our targeted killings have had an effect. What is your sense of that? I think we have to be cautious, uh, but nonetheless, I think it's encouraging news. Cautious because any number of times over the past five or six years, Al-Qaeda's obituary has been written. We've only seen them rise from the grave to commit some new depredation or else to once again radicalize certain segments of key countries or indeed plot and plan attacks or even carry them out. So we should always be cautious. Al-Qaeda is not a movement, having survived now more than 20 years, that's going to be easily laid to rest. At the same time, though, I think it's almost unprecedented, except perhaps during the 2001-2002 period, at the very beginning of the war on terrorism, where so many mid and senior level Al-Qaeda commanders and operatives have been so systematically eliminated. According to the US intelligence community, since July, some eight senior to mid-level people have been killed. What this does is really erode Al-Qaeda's bench in a very concentrated, short-term manner, which I think does have greater damage, perhaps, than when it's spread over a longer period. So this is a significant accomplishment. But I think it's still too soon to assess the long-term effects. For those of us who know less about Al-Qaeda than you do, really, how deep is their bench? What does it mean when there are eight or so people uh, taken out at the top levels? Well, I mean, you know, answering that is almost like saying how long is a ball of string in some respects. We don't know, really. I think that's the worrisome thing about Al-Qaeda, is that its bench has proven much deeper than we ever imagined, that it's always had this enormous capacity to replace and replenish key leaders. So over the years, many times we've gotten the number three, the number four, but yet a new number three and number four has appeared. What may be the different this time is that the intelligence community is, is claiming that, again, in this very concentrated period of time, we've gotten three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now, that's a serious erosion of Al-Qaeda's strength. Doubtless, they have the individuals who can fill the ranks, but I think the training period involved, the coming up to speed, the loss of institutional memory, the loss of trust between controllers and commanders and either their um, disciples or their foot soldiers is, is really enormous. Also, there's one other effect, too. People who may be attracted to Al-Qaeda may reason. If they can reach out and get these highly protected, very important VIP Al-Qaeda individuals, gosh, what are they going to do when they get me in their sights? So does this make you worry less about uh, the idea that we're closing down Guantanamo and even if we think that is a good thing ethically and for the United States' reputation, there's been talk, of course, that we have bred through our policies a new set of terrorists who we're just letting loose, along with those who we have probably uh, improperly imprisoned. Also, of course, discussion of all the jihadis that were created during our time in Iraq. Does this affect how likely it is that these recruits will actually come to be uh, killers? Well, I think, I mean, one of the problems with Guantanamo is, as you point out, we don't know how many killers we've created, actually, who may not have been before, in addition to those who already hardened cases. I think there's something of a canard in some of the concerns that have been expressed that these rehabilitation programs, particularly in Saudi Arabia, where some of these Guantanamo detainees have wound up, are somehow miserable failures. Uh, in my view, that's a gross over-exaggeration. I mean, we're, ta we're talking about 12% of people that have been released, that have been through the program, that have become recidivists, who have gone back to terrorism. I, mean, I don't think in the United States that the recidivist rate for hardened criminals is as low as 12%. We're really talking about a small number. I think rather than focusing on them, we should focus on the 88% that, in fact, have not gone back to terrorism. And that's a success, I think, in two dimensions. One is that it shows that you don't have to take people, throw them in jail, imprison them forever, toss away the key it demonstrates that they can be rehabilitated. But secondly, I think it gets away from this notion that's become prevalent, not only throughout the Muslim world, one has to say, but in other quarters of the world, that the war on terror immediately equates to a war on Islam by showing that these people are not evildoers incarnate that can never be changed, that you just have to you know, do something with them extrajudicially forever. 
the fact that you can rehabilitate the vast majority, I mean, well over three quarters, which I think is an astonishing rate, shows that we're not waging war on Islam, that we want to make people back or turn them back into productive citizens that respect the rule of law, that don't have to turn to violence to champion their political causes. And to me, that's an enormous success, not an enormous failure. And how does this then pertain to immigrants in Europe who have obviously been a problem for the British government, for the French government? You have been one of the proponents of ties between Al-Qaeda Central and those in Britain, for example if the high, higher ranking Al-Qaeda officers are no longer around, does this mean that there's less of a problem in those countries in Europe? Well, you know, I've studied terrorism now for more than 30 years, and the one thing I've learned is that there's always some bad news that comes with the good news. It's never unequivocally or uncategorically positive. And even the intelligence community will concede that having eliminated this, you know, mid to senior level echelon of Al-Qaeda commanders is enormously positive as it is. It probably has no effect on the estimated at least 100 persons that have come from Europe with clean passports that can be used uh, to enter the United States because their countries are part of the visa waiver program. They said it has no impact on them. They've already, the barn door has already been opened and the horse has left. That they've been trained, they've been deployed. The plans are already in motion in essence? Presumably. And we've seen that pattern in the past. I think though a key here though is that all of these operatives in Europe answer to al-Qaeda controllers in Pakistan. I mean, there's been a bit debate in recent years whether this is bottom-up or top-down. At least the key terrorist plots and incidents, almost without exception, going back to 2001 in the United Kingdom, uh, in particular, have all linked back to al-Qaeda handlers and commanders in Pakistan or Afghanistan. Now, if we have systematically killed and eliminated this whole mid-level echelon, it means you're going to have these foot soldiers basically at odds or on their own without orders or instructions, at least for a time, in Europe. Now, the problem is, though, they're probably capable of acting independently. Does this make you uh, think that there will be some effect on the efficacy of the Taliban now, or is that entirely detached from al-Qaeda in the federally administered tribal areas? Well, I think the Taliban on both sides of the border provides al-Qaeda in South Asia, firstly, with a purpose, because it's plussing up, it's improving their capabilities, it provides, I think, very useful strategic and tactical advice to the Taliban uh, in terms of training, in, term of, in terms of provision of intelligence, um, often the same way that we often have U.S. military officers seconded or serving with units in Iraq and Afghanistan with their national armies. Al-Qaeda has its operatives serving alongside the Taliban. So there's a certain, I think, symbiosis between them. Also, the symbiosis in some ways has reversed in that I think Al-Qaeda, as it may have fallen on more difficult financial times, at least one of uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri's recent statements, um, talked about the need for contributions um, from wealthy uh, benefactors, let's say, in the Gulf or elsewhere in, in, in the Muslim world. The fact that the Taliban is profiting so extensively from the narcotics trade that last year was a record year for poppy production in Afghanistan means that they probably have more than enough money to spread around, including to their patrons in Al-Qaeda. So in that sense, I think the fortunes of the Taliban and the fact, unfortunately, that they're rising in both countries strengthens Al-Qaeda, or at least assures that even though we may weaken Al-Qaeda's mid to senior level leadership, that al-Qaeda still is going to be able to enhance and promote its longevity for some time to come. Okay, thank you so much. I think that that is all we have time for. So we are hoping that you will be here again with us to talk about the next developments in al-Qaeda. I'd be delighted.